Our message this morning is coming out of the book of Judges. The book of Judges. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to chapter 6. You know, when you start reading the book of Judges, it isn't long before you realize that this is not a very pleasant book. In fact, it is one of the darkest books of the Bible. Because it describes a period in Israel's history when they were without strong and godly leadership. And constantly, as a result, they fell into sin. Judges 17 verse 6 reads, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That about sums up the times and the book of Judges. You see, when you leave man to himself, it wouldn't be long before he would find himself in trouble, right? And this was the case of Israel at the time. God had birthed them in the furnace of grace, and he had delivered them from the horrible slavery of Egypt. He had led them through the wilderness, given them blessing on top of blessing. They were a favored people. They were chosen, they were the chosen ones of the Lord God Almighty. Forty years he led them, fed them, and protected them. He led them into the land of Canaan. This was their promised land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, and it was given to them by the sovereign grace and will of God. God had given himself to Israel. He gave them a Lord. He gave them the land of Canaan. He gave them a land. He gave them his commandments. He gave them a law. But Israel denied the Lord, they defiled the land, and they defied the law. And as a result, God was forced to judge this people that he had loved so much. As we move through the book of Judges, a clear pattern emerges. The children of Israel would serve the Lord as long as they had a strong leader. And when that leader passed on from the scene, they fell back into their sins. And when they sinned, God used the pagan nations around them to chastise them. And then he would, they would call on the Lord and he would answer them. He would send them a judge. He would send them help. And then they would fall back into sin again. They went through this cycle throughout their time. And in chapter 6, verse 11, chapter 6, verse 11, we are introduced to a man named Gideon. His name means he who cuts down. And when Gideon appears on the scene, it doesn't seem like he is going to be much of a deliverer. Actually, he is found hiding from the enemies of Israel. But God, in spite of his fearfulness, God used him mightily to bring deliverance to Israel. God used him as a one in a wonderful way. But our message is not about Gideon this morning. Our message is about verses 1 to 10. It is about the events that staged, set the stage for Gideon coming on the scene and bringing deliverance to them. These verses hold some powerful lessons for us. And I want us to see those lessons. And I want us to see how we apply them or how we can apply them to our lives. I have titled our message today, The High Cost of Low Living. A high cost of low living. We will see that Israel paid a, paid a high cost for how they lived. For a theme, I have selected that disobedience to the will of the Lord in our lives carries a price higher than we would ever hope to pay. Disobedience to the will of God in our lives will carry a higher price than we ever hope to pay. Let's read the high cost of low living. Read with me. Judges chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them. 
and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their camels and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for the multitude for both they and their camels were without number and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. The Bible simply states that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. We do not know what their sin was, but we can assume that it was the same sin that they had been guilty of in the past. For we read back in chapter 2, And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Again, in, verse, in chapter 3 we read, And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and Amorites, and Perizzites, and Evites, and Jebusites, and they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot Lord, the Lord their God, and served the Baalim and the groves. Israel seemed prone to walk in the same foolish pathway, always guilty of falling in the same trap. They were surrounded by pagan nations who worshipped false gods. They were surrounded by people who were continually trying to draw them away from God and into their own wicked lifestyle. As long as Israel had strong leadership, they were able to live clean. But when that leadership failed, they wandered away from the Lord. They were weak, vacillating people who had trouble staying the course with the Lord. But before we get too hard upon them, before we come down on them, I know I am preaching to a people who have the same problem. Every one of us deal with certain areas of weakness in our lives, don't we? There are areas in our lives where we seem to have constant Struggle for righteousness and holiness. The book of Hebrews refers to those areas as the sin which so easily beset you. The word easily beset means to skillfully surround. You see, our flesh loves sin. And our enemy, Satan, is a shrewd enemy. He knows our weaknesses. He knows how to entice us and draw us away into evil. He lays the trap because he knows what we like and what makes us tick. Everyone here has areas of lives that cause, in their lives that cause us trouble. There are areas in which we are weak. Some people have trouble with their language. Some people have problems with being stubborn and unwilling to submit to leadership. Some people have problems with gossip. Some people have problems with sexual sin. Some people have a pull towards alcohol and drugs. People struggle in many different ways and many different areas. And we all know, each one of us know where our weaknesses are. We know given the right circumstances, we will have trouble overcoming temptation. But if you want to succeed, if you want to win in this, white, in this fight against sin, then there are definite areas and definite things we can do. Amen? And one of the things you can do is don't play too close to the trap that Satan sets for you. If you know that there is an area of danger in your life, then stay away from that area. Amen? Follow the example of Joseph. 
Joseph knew of his master's desire for him and he was prepared for it. The Bible tells us that every time she approached him, he refused her. And when she did lay hold of him, he was ready. He let go his, his coat into her hands and he ran. Heed the advice given to, to, to Timothy. Paul tells Timothy, flee youthful lusts. He cautions, give no place to the devil. We are told that the enemy, like a roaring lion, is wandering all over the place just looking for you. Don't get into his, his eyesight. Move away. Hallelujah. Instead of trying to toy with the temptation that you see before you, look for the way of escape. The Bible tells us that God will make a way of escape for you, but you have to look for it and find it. Learn to consider that you are dead to sin and its influence. The Bible tells you as a redeemed saint of God, as a born again saint of God, that is to be your new position. Consider that you are dead to sin and its trespasses. Determine in your heart that you are going to live for God and for him only. Hallelujah. Because sin has a, we have a constant problem and sin is always going to be in front of us. But it doesn't have to dominate us. Amen. It doesn't have to dominate us. We can have victory in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Sin does not have to have dominion over us. So don't do like the Israelites and embrace sin into your life. If you want to be victorious. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do not embrace sin. No, look, with, look at verse 6 with me. Uh, sorry, uh, just follow with me the pattern that we see here. For I want you to see because of their sin, I want you to see the suffering that Israel had to endure. These verses, verses 1 to 6, chronicle the terrible, the terrible price that Israel had to pay for their foolishness in sinning against God. When they suffered, what they suffered serves to remind us that we do not get away from sin. And I want you to remember that the word of God tells us that these things are, re are recorded for our example. The Holy Spirit did not record Judges chapter 6 so that nobody would not read it and follow it. It was recorded for our example so we can read it and understand what happened to them. Amen. So what they suffered serves to remind us that we do not get away with sin. We might think we can hide it. We might think that no one will find out. But the truth is that God knows and in his time he will expose it to just what it is. Scripture tells us be sure your sin will find you out. Jesus said there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Neither hid nor shall not be known. So let, let us examine. Let us examine these verses and see what's happening. And as we do, I want you to remember the same judgment or worse might be upon our lives if we fail to live for the Lord. Firstly, they suffered invasion. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. And the, high, the hand of the Midian, Midianites prevailed against them. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and caves. and holes. They were forced to hide in their own land. Israel was oppressed by the Midianites. Now the Midianites were the descendants of Abram, just like the Israelites were. They descended from a man named Midian. Midian was the fourth son of Abraham and Keturah. After Sarah died, Ab Abraham married another woman and had four more sons. Median was one of them. And the Medianites appear from time to time in the Bible. Moses married a Medianite woman named Zipporah. In the book of Numbers, the Medianites searched out and found Balaam the prophet to seduce Israel. And they, were, he, they, they, they called on, on Balaam to curse Israel. And even though God prevented 
Balaam from cursing Israel. Yet Balaam, the, the book, read the book of Numbers, you see. Three different times he set up, he had he and the Midianites set up seven altars on which they burnt false offerings. So even though he didn't curse Israel, he encouraged them into false worship. And the Bible tells us that it worked. And 24,000 men were slain in one day because of a plague that God sent in the midst because of that. And the word median means strife, conflict. The Medianites are a clear picture of the conflict that the world has with the truth of God that you and I are supposed to be obedient to. Just think about it. The word means conflict and strife. And the Balaams of our day have set up all kinds of altars in our midst. Abortion, Medianite. Homosexuality, Medianite. Gay marriage, Medianite. Gender identity, Medianite. Why do I say that? Because all they do is con create conflict and strife. And the people of God are exposed to it. And some of them are even moving across to it. Huh. They're a picture of a corrupt world. And its desire to draw the people away from God. Away from his laws. Away from his teachings. Away from his standards. They are a Medianite. And they are encouraging and drawing the people away from God. And the only reason why the Medianites had the power... Over people of God is because God's people was unfaithful to the Lord. They refused to live at his standards. Their sin lowered the wall of separation between them and the world. Israel got into trouble because they refused to walk with the Lord. And when we refuse to stay close to the Lord and live according to his word, we open the door of affliction in our lives. Our troubles often come because of our own foolish decisions. Our sin translates to weakness. And our weakness invites the enemies of righteousness to attack us. Our weaknesses results in our being invaded by and attacked by and overrun by the world. So they were invaded. They were imprisoned in their own land. The oppression of Israel by the Midianites resulted in Israel losing its will to fight. They ran away and hid in the mountains while the enemy overran their land. Their sin made them weak. It caused them to lose their will to fight. It left them utterly defeated. And when we allow sin to reign in our lives, we will find the same thing is true. Because sin robs us of our character. It leaves us unwilling and unable to fight. And when we allow sin to rule in our hearts, we become listless and lifeless and lethargic in our Christian life. We refuse to get up and fight. Sin causes us to hide in fear while the enemy takes everything we value. There are people in this room who have been imprisoned by their sins. You have allowed certain actions and ways of living to dominate you so long that you have lost your will and your ability to fight against them. You're a prisoner in your own life and you hide in fear from the actions you think you cannot fight against. May I tell you that Jesus has the power to set you free? <laughs> Hallelujah! But you cannot hide in fear from your sin and still hope to enjoy the Lord's freedom. If you would be free, you must be deal with your sin. You must deal with your sin. You must confess it. You must repent of it. You must forsake it. Ah, the word of God says, He that hide it, cover it his sin, cannot prosper. Amen. Hallelujah. You, if, you, if you're going to be free, you must be proactive. It will not just happen. You have to get up and take a, sin against, uh, take a stand against sin in your life. Hallelujah. Because sin will remain as long as you allow it. 
Not only did they suffer invasion and did they suffer imprisonment, they suffer impoverishment. Verse 3 tells us that, that, that Israel was impoverished. And the word means to make poor. It means to be deprived of strength or vitality. The word means to make slack or feeble. It has the connotation of, uh, you, you have seen those, those films where people are walking with, with, with staves on their shoulders and a, and a bucket is hanging on it. It has that connotation of a, of a bucket hanging, dangling on a piece of stick and it speaks of, 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 of a listless attitude. It speaks of coming to the end of your rope where you have nowhere else to go. They were impoverished. It is a picture of helplessness and hopelessness. It is a picture of a people at the very end of, their, of themselves with nowhere to go and nowhere to know what, nothing to do. They don't know how to fight. They have lost their will. Israel saw everything they loved taken away from them. They planted their fields and their enemies came and took the, 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 the crops. They saw their livestock taken away. They were left with no sustenance, said the word. They were literally made weak and they were literally at the end of their rope. Everything that they valued was taken from them. Everything they needed to live and to sustain was gone. They were left with nothing. That's what sin does. It strips us of everything we value and everything we live for. It leaves us slack and weak and at the very end of our rope. And if you choose to live your life under the control of sin, then do not be surprised when you wake up and find that everything that you value has been taken from you. Some people choose to live, live in sin and their marriage is now gone. Some people raise their children to be the best and have the best and they fail to teach them to love the Lord and to live for the Lord. And later on in life, those same parents see that their children depart and never return to the Lord. Some people live for material things, forgetting that this material world is just transient. They invest their lives pursuing wealth and gathering things. And at the end of their life, they realize that they have nothing. They can take nothing with them. Some people are caught up in getting their own way all the time. They step on the feelings and the needs of others to get there. And there comes a time in their life when they realize that they have nobody. And I don't know what you are investing in today, but I want to tell you that there is nothing, there is nothing better than investing your life and your supplies and your whole and everything you have in Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. For the word of God tells us, be not deceived, be not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Hallelujah. I don't know what you were investing in, but I hope it is in Jesus. Because it's only in Jesus that dividends that are eternal are paid. Hallelujah. So what are you investing in today? And in verse 7 we see, verse 7 and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel which said unto them. They cried unto the Lord. And the word of God tells us, and the Lord heard them. Oh, what grace. How gracious is our Lord. That no matter how many times we fail him, no matter how many times we fall away from him, no matter how many times we turn away, he's always there to forgive us. He's always there to hear us. He's always there to receive us, always there to restore us. When we repent and turn back to him in faith, he never turns us away. He hears us. For this is his promise to his people. Thank God for his grace, for his faithfulness, and for his mercy. God heard their cry. But I want you to see. He doesn't send them a deliverer immediately. God sent them an unknown prophet instead. And may I take this time to tell you. Every time a minister stands here delivering God's word to you. That's what he's doing. He's sending a message. God sends a message to his people. And the message is always the same he, the message was designed to remind them of who they were. 
The message was designed to confront their failure in light of God's faithfulness to them. The message was designed to remind them of how good the Lord had been to them. The message was designed to remind them how they should have been living because of their relationship with God. Oh, that we would heed the message of God as he sends it to us. Hallelujah. That we would hear him. The word of God tells us, call on the Lord in the day of your trouble and he will hear you and he will answer you. Sometimes he answers you by sending you a man from himself. God sent a man of God with a message from God to tell them, to show them where they were. Hallelujah. For God had moved and listen, read, read, read with me the words of God. Thus say it the Lord God of Israel, I brought you from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand that, of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites in whose land you live. But he ends it by saying, but you have not obeyed me. How often we hear the word of God, but we don't obey. It goes here and it comes out here. God sends us a message every time some minister stands here before you and brings the word of God. For God tells them, notice with me, they are reminded of God's deliverance. God had moved in supernatural power to deliver Israel from bondage in Egypt. God had given them a deliverer in Moses. God demonstrated his power over the Egyptian gods through the plagues that fell on the land. God brought them out in great power. God parted the Red Sea so they can cross on dry ground. If for nothing else, they should have been faithful to God because of his grace and his salvation in their lives. Hallelujah. And God's grace has been the same and more to you and I. He has not parted the Red Sea for me. He has not sent plagues for me. But he did give his son to die on a cross for me. Hallelujah. He did write my name in his book. He did love me in spite of my sin. He did save me when I was on my way to hell. He did change my life when I called to him in faith. And for that reason and that reason alone, he deserves my faithfulness, my love, and my devotion. Amen. If for that reason only because he saved me. Hallelujah. That's why I should not have to be coddled and to be coaxed and to be pampered and to be begged to come to church. Hallelujah. I should not be upset when I don't get my will all the time. I should not whine and gripe and complain about my lot in life. I should not have to be begged to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. I was on my way to hell when he saw me and saved me. Should he not have my absolute undivided attention and devotion? Think back on how the Lord saved your soul. Does the fact that he saved you mean anything to you? Hallelujah. It should mean everything to you that he saved you. They are reminded also of God's deeds. Not only did God deliver them from Egypt. God went to them every step of the way. He led them. He fed them. He drove the enemies off in front of them. He never failed them. Even when they failed him. He gave them a good land. And he blessed them far beyond what they deserved. They should have been faithful to him. Because of his blessing in their lives. What about you and I? Look around you. Look up. Look around. Look all around you and see. Look within in you and see the evidence of God's blessing on our lives. He has been good to us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He has blessed us materially, physically, financially. And most of all, he has blessed us spiritually. He has infused us with his own spirit. We are blood brought Oh, born again, redeemed the children of God. We are children of the kingdom. 
He has blessed us beyond what we can even ask or think. He has been faithful to us and he has given us his best. Shouldn't we be faithful to him out of gratitude for all the things he has done for us? Hallelujah. You wouldn't have anything except it was given to you by the Lord. For every good thing in your life has come through his hand. Look at your blessings. Count them if you will. Name them one by one. Your home, your health, your family, your salvation. Hasn't the Lord been good to you? Oh, doesn't he deserve the best in return? The Lord has given us everything that we need. Oh, he has elevated us and seated us in the high places with his son. Oh, even if he were to take everything away from me, I would still have to say, God has been good. God has blessed me. He has been good to me. He's reminded also, they are reminded also of God's demands. God reminds them that he, not the, gods of, not the God of the pagans, is their God. His words here remind us that he is a jealous God who will not allow those whom he has redeemed to go after God, other gods. Hallelujah. Israel is made to see that they're, they're suffering because they feel, failed to keep God in first place. Where is God in your life? Is he first place? They had allowed other things to come ahead of him and they were paying a high price for their low living. God has not changed. He's still a jealous God. God has not shown change. If he has given you Jesus, if he has chosen you in Jesus, if he has saved you by his grace, if he has entered into a saving relationship with you, then he expects that you would live for him and for him alone. Hallelujah. He does not expect that you would be living for yourself. He does not expect that you will be living for your things and your possessions. He expects that you are going to walk with him and that you will love him and that you will live according to his will. And when you do, he will bless you greatly. And when you don't, there is a high price to pay. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you belong to the Lord, you can expect that you will pay a high price when you live below his standards. He says in Revelations, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. In Hebrews, he tells us that that chastening is for our benefit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. The high cost of low living. Look at your life right now, church. Who is first in your life? If it is anyone other than Christ, you are headed for trouble. Because low living carries a high price. What will your disobedience cost if you continue in it? What price are you willing to pay for the lifestyle you are living now? Whatever it is, your sin is not worth what it will cost you in the long run. And if the Lord has spoken to you, if he has spoken to your heart about any area of your life, I ask you to bring it to him now. See, God sends a message and he expects his people to heed that message. Are you saved? Are you living close and clean? Are you being faithful to him? Or are you reaping a whirlwind of chaos in your life? Has he spoken to any area of your life through this word? If he has, I urge you, don't delay. Come to him and deal with it. Allow me to close with this quote from Isaiah chapter 1. Come now and let us reason together, say it the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Many of us quote the script here, but we stop right there. Hear the next verse. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured by the sword. 
For the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. For the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. If indeed the mouth of the Lord has spoken, let us be willing and obedient. Can we obey the word of God this morning? Will you say amen with me? Amen. Hallelujah. We thank you for your word this morning, Father. We love the times when we tell us, when you tell us all the wonderful blessings you have in store for us. But Father, you have called us to hear your whole counsel. Your word declares, Behold the goodness of God. But behold also that the Lord is a jealous God. Behold the goodness of God. But see also the severity and the wrath of God. We thank you for reminding us, Father. For calling us back to that place of righteousness and holiness. May we never have to suffer like Israel did. May we never stray from the path that you have for us. May we never have to find out the high cost we must pay because we live below your standards. I ask you, Lord, to wash your people with your word this morning. Restore, revive. Give us, O oh Lord, your strength that we may live for you. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor now in the name of Jesus. And the people of God believed with me and said, Amen, Amen, Amen.